hello also from my side. My name is Christian Kronikowski and I work for the German Aerospace Center in Oberpfaffenhofen, close to Munich. So I hope you can see my slides and then I will start directly. So floods are one of the most frequently occurring natural disasters worldwide and are responsible for high numbers of casualties and can cause immense destructions. Sorry, that was too fast. So floods, we can predict floods up to a certain level by combining meteorological data with hydrological data. And we offer those predictions on various spatial scales. For instance, the European flood awareness system as well as the global flood awareness system, both being part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. However, those predictions usually do not cover the flood peak or they came too late for an emergency response. In a crisis situation, um, usually rapid mapping is activated after the greatest impact where the flood peak is frequently missed. What is happening then is that we order data at first, we analyze the data and we produce a map from that covering the flooded area of interest. But all of this takes a lot of time. So the technical side here is not an issue because with a growing number of satellites, we could support rapid mapping activations worldwide. But that does not compensate for this time consuming step as it binds a lot of human resources. A way out of it would be to implement a global and automated flood monitoring system. And luckily, the Copernicus Sentinel one satellite constellation offers us for the first time the opportunity to establish a high resolution, high revisit frequency monitoring of floods under all weather conditions and on a global scale. Thus, unreported events are not longer missed and the flood event is covered over the entire duration time. Also, the user does not have to activate a rapid mapping to, to get access to the flood detection results immediately. We enable the users to first check if the Sentinel-1 acquisitions are sufficient enough to monitor the particular flood of interest. A rapid mapping can still be activated after that, and it could also include further data sources like optical data coming from Sentinel-2 or other Copernicus contributing missions. So a small drawback when increasing the process data when going global is that false alarms occur more frequently, of course, but with a higher data amount and optimized models the accuracy is also meant to increase in the end. So in global flood monitoring, we heavily utilized data coming from the Sentinel-1 satellite mission. And Sentinel-1 is a synthetic aperture radar system bringing sensor-specific strengths to monitor floods from space. What we are looking for is a contrast between water and non-water. For instance, we observe specular scattering mechanisms over calm water bodies like oceans and lakes. For instance, Lake Merced in the southwest of the city of San Francisco. Those areas have a low signal return and we usually encode them in dark colors. What is challenging are water lookalikes with a similar low signal return like water. And when talking about water lookalikes, we mean tarmacs, roads, dry soil, wet snow, and agricultural fields under certain conditions. Those areas can produce false positives. Also, wind can roughen a water surface and can disturb the specular scattering mechanism. These surfaces then have a higher signal return and can be mistaken as land as it would be then a false negative. We also observe vertical structures which are common in urban areas and forests. 
the radar signal comes in and bounces off twice from the surface and is sent back to the sensor. There, we usually observe a high radar signal return and we encode these pixels in bright colors. We also observe over dense vegetation and irregular surfaces, some fuzzy backscatter patterns like here in the Golden Gate Park in the Eastern part of San Francisco. There, we can observe some contrast between water and non-water features, but that, that doesn't have to be the situation. It can be that we also produce false negatives because the contrast is not high enough. So I was mostly talking about the challenges when working with a system like Sentinel-1. And in global flood monitoring, we decided to tackle these challenges from many sides by utilizing different algorithms because a single algorithm does not solve all the problems mentioned before. Instead of using only one algorithm, we combine three matured algorithms that cover different aspects. One of them comes from the German Aerospace Center, the DLR, relying on a single center one scene and tiling the radar scene into smaller patches looking for both water and land in it. An automatically computed threshold is applied, separating the both classes, land and water. In the post-classification step, we further refine the result and we compute the likelihood of the correct classification with the help of fuzzy logic. The second algorithm coming from Teovin relies on a data cube solution and tracks every sentence one scene acquired so far. A harmonic model is built from a time series of Sentinel-1 scenes where flood is the deviation from the harmonic mean. The likelihood is the probability of the opposing class. So if detecting flood, the likelihood can be computed from the probability of the non-flood classification for the current pixel. The third algorithm coming from list relies on a change detection solution and requires a Sentinel-1 scene acquired at an earlier timestamp. Flood is detected as a deviating water surface accompanied with a classification probability that also serves as the likelihood of a correct classification. <clears throat> as I already said, three algorithms are more robust than a single one. And we combine the three algorithms in an ensemble approach, which operates on pixel level. We implemented a majority voting deciding if a pixel is flooded or not. So at least two out of three algorithms must agree on the classification result. We also output the likelihood, so the confidence of the classification. And the likelihood is defined as the arithmetic mean of all participating algorithms, even if one of them disagreed with the majority vote. Thus, the ensemble likelihood reflects the full classification confidence. It ranges from zero to 100, and the higher the number gets, the more confident we are with our flood classification. So on this slide, I want to show you first some, sorry, it's always going to the wrong one. I want to show you some results. At the top left, we have a Sentinel-1 scene from a pre-flood event, so from an earlier timestamp. We have the dark ocean in the east and the elongating river also in dark colors. Next to it, we have a Sentinel-1 scene from the flood event, so from a later timestamp. We can see more darker surfaces irregularly shaped and having fuzzy edges, and we assume that these areas are flooded here. So in our ensemble flood result at the bottom left, we have flood pixels that deviate from a reference water data set and are denoted as flood in light blue colors. Next to it, on the bottom right, we have the ensemble likelihood where we have flooded areas showing high class confidences being encoded in bluish colors and propagating towards a pixel value of 100. We also have non-flooded pixels, which show low likelihood values and are therefore encoded in yellowish colors. The rest full um, pixels are transparent here, showing the um, radar scene beneath it, because we did not perform a flood inference there and did not produce any ensemble likelihoods. 
So we implement an ensemble algorithm to benefit from the strengths of the individual algorithms and to balance out the weaknesses. That makes the ensemble flood output a complex product. And because of that, not all errors can be resolved. We have wet snow, we have frozen or dry soil, which are still challenging. And we also have agricultural fields that may act as water lookalikes and can produce false positives, as can be seen in the example on the right. At first, we have an earlier certain one subset at the top left. And at the bottom of that, we have a Sentinel-1 subset from a later timestamp. And we can already see that the agricultural fields I'm talking about are colored in a much darker tone. These fields are not flooded, but the ensemble algorithm denoted them as flood. So we are um, observing false positives here. Therefore, to interpret our results, we need additional information supporting our interpretation. We have the likelihood layer informing about the classification confidence. We have an exclusion mask because we exclude certain areas from the computation where the flood inference is hampered or impossible, but more of that later in the next slides. We also have the reference water mask informing about water that is already present on a very stable level. And we should also consider environmental factors like precipitation frequency, soil moisture influencing the radar response. But we should also gain some knowledge about the area of interest that can help us in understanding the local processes. So all in all, we provide three outputs in relation to water. We have the observed flood extent coming from the ensemble flood algorithm. We have the reference water mask, which is an ensemble product of the water detections coming from DLR and LIST. We have in the reference water as a subset, the permanent water layers like oceans, lakes, and rivers here on the map in a darker blue tone. And we have also the reference water mask seasonal water surfaces coming from surfaces that are periodically flooded and in the map denoted in cyan blue tones. And the last layer we output here is the observed water extent, which is a combination of observed water and the reference water mask. In gray at the edge, we have image features that are to be excluded. So the exclusion mask covers areas that prevent or hamper the flood delineation. Radar shadows do not allow any Sentinel-1 signal analysis because objects on the ground block the radar signal. Permanent low backscatter describes immobile image features that are water lookalikes, such as tarmacs or sandy structures. We have no sensitivity describing areas where the algorithms cannot distinguish between flood and non-flood very well, typically occurring over dense vegetation, like in the extreme example here, but also in urban areas. And the last one, we have certain areas that are too far away from the next drainage and are unlikely to be flooded. We exclude these areas not prone to flooding with the hand layer, which stands for hide above nearest drainage. So the user is formed in a transparent way where to expect flood and why. We have the exclusion mask. We have the likelihood values ranging from one, uh, from zero to 100, informing about the cl uh, classification confidence. And we have also the advisory flags informing us about areas where we expect challenging circumstances, where we should treat the result with more caution, like observing um, low backscattering regions, acting as water lookalikes, or water surfaces rough by wind that can influence the radar signal return. So before ending my presentation, I want to finally show you the final results with all the data that was mentioned in this talk. We overlook the same example as before in Eastern Australia and have a pre-event Sentinel-1 scene on the top right and below that um, um, Sentinel-1 scene from the event, from the actual event. We have flooded areas marked in a light blue tone with a reference water on top in dark blue colors. As said before, the flood delineation can be hampered under certain circumstances, and we exclude these areas from the results and mark them here in a rose tone. Although it looks like we simply exclude anything that is interesting here, 
we should consider the fact that the hand layer makes up almost two thirds of the exclusion mask. With that, we can focus on areas prone to flooding and can produce robust results that help affected people, disaster managers, and other stakeholders to derive urgent responses to the disaster. So not everything can be covered in 15 minutes. And if you want to know more, we are happy to also present the wiki covering a lot more details than presented here. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions.